So just very quickly, you probably you know, know this better even than I do, you know, with Parkinson's. But again, it's a lot of signaling you know, from the brain down the spinal cord and then to the bladder nerves, okay, for everything to work right. For the bladder to store urine, everything, the bladder has to be relaxed. The sphincter has to be tight so nothing comes out, okay? And then when you want to urinate, okay, the sphincter actually has to relax, the bladder has to squeeze. So it has, it has to go from signals from your brain, above the brain stem, through the relay stations in the spinal cord, think of it that way, okay? And then down to the bladder, the receptors onto the bladder. And Parkinson's disease is in the midbrain area, and so what it tends to these higher diseases tend to make the bladder overactive in general, okay? So just remember that. So for a lot of patients, it's they can't hold it, gotta go, gotta go a lot more, can't sit through a movie, right? Can't sit through uh, a nice dinner out. So that's what we want to improve on, just so you can kind of get back and enjoy life and do some of those normal things. So first line is usually medication. Okay, it's considered kind of non-invasive, um, but I'm gonna tell you about the issues, same thing with all the Parkinson medication, the side effects. I don't take them lightly. Um, I don't really think of them as invasive. And I tell the patients, and I, you know, we need to kind of discuss all the side effects and how, how much you can tolerate them. So there's really only one single class of drugs that we have, and that's where a lot of research is happening. You know, this is what we have for decades. It's rather sad. We don't really have anything new. How it works is that, you know, for muscle to contract, which is your bladder, so this is the bladder lining, and there are these receptors, muscarinic receptors. The acetylcholine that comes out of your nerve has to attach to this and make the muscle contract. Okay? And so how the drugs work is that it blocks this receptor so that you can have all the acetylcholine in the world it can't bind to these receptors and it can't make your bladder contract. Sounds pretty good, right? Bladder doesn't spasm, it doesn't contract. You don't have as much of the urgency that every time the bladder kind of squeezes throughout the day that it causes. That's how it's supposed to work. And these are the players. You must have seen commercials. Um, the kind of pipe, you know, let's see, Vesicare is the one that you see with pipes, you know, the pipe kind of stick figure and, and um, Toviaz is the new drug out um, most recently and similar to what Dr. Glass had mentioned, that's because it's made by the same company that makes Detra and Detra is about to go off patent. Um, it's actually a very similar medication, but these are all the major players on the market right now, okay? And how do they work? All about the same, okay? So I don't care how fancy the commercials are, this is, you know, from someone who we do this all the time, what we've done is we looked at all of their studies and the bottom line is, and, and thousands of patients, there's no one major star. So I cannot tell you, no, you try that drug first, it works the best. The thing is, each body is a different, so it's worthwhile trying maybe a couple. Maybe one will work better for you than someone else, and another may have less side effects for you than someone else. So it's all right but you do have to keep in mind the side effects, okay? So that it's safe for you, that's the key. Now the side effects. Side effect for this class of medication, which is what we call anticholinergics, okay? It blocks the receptor on the bladder, okay? And these are muscarinic receptors, so that's why sometimes they're also called anti-muscarinic medications. The trouble is we have five types of muscarinic receptors in our body. The drug kind of blocks all of them. They're not so good at selectively just targeting the bladder, which is actually the problem for a lot of, our, a lot of the drugs that we use. Okay, it doesn't just take care of the eye problem, it kind of hits everything else. So we have muscarinic receptors in our eyes, in our salivary glands, heart, stomach, colon, and that's why you have problems with dry mouth, constipation, sometimes dry eyes, blurry vision, okay? Those are what we consider a tolerability type of issue. 
And sometimes if you take it, you know, a month, two months, you seem to kind of get used to it and it doesn't seem to be too bothersome. But there are also safety issues and those are the effects where someone doesn't think quite so clearly, okay? And I usually tell the family to look for that, right? Because the patient doesn't usually know they're not thinking so clearly. Cardiac effects, okay? There's some very rare um, heart issues that can come with taking these medications and obviously drug interactions. So no drug is really benign, okay? And, and I think there's some statistic over the age of 65, the average number of medications someone's on is 14, okay? Including over-the-counter stuff and so, you know, and we have no idea what all the interactions are, so. So beside drugs, let's say you come see me, you're like, I've already tried three of the, those drugs. You know, they, they kind of work, maybe 20%, but God, the dry mouth was horrendous, and you know, I was already having trouble with constipation with all the other medications I'm on. This just, you know, tipped me over. Okay, so what else do we have for you? First are these what we consider behavior treatments, behavior modification or conservative. These are truly conservative, and you can try this. Okay, and this actually helps with both urge incontinence and stress incontinence. Okay, all very similar. So this is worthwhile for everybody, to be honest. Okay, fluid and dietary modification. Um, there are some people who just drink a lot. And whether it's because they read somewhere that you need, you know, eight glasses of fluid a day or the more the better. And, you know, they, they're the ones who carry that liter bottle around with them all the time. And they come see me and they tell me they pee every hour. And I look at the six liters of fluid that they drink after we do a little diary for them. And you're like, <laughs> you know, you don't need to go to medical school to figure out, you know, if you drink a little less, you'll pee a little less. But sadly, a lot of my patients, they've already cut back all the fluids. Okay, they've kind of figured that out. So it's not the once in a while, the ones who really over drink. But do remember, you know, the eight glasses a day, um, actually really isn't correct. You know, they, they didn't really base it on a lot of <laughs> really rigorous science, and afterwards they've done some physiology studies. Everybody is different, right? A little five-foot little gal is not gonna have the same requirements as a six-foot man who works outdoors and, and requires more fluid. And also remember, water counts, soup counts, juice counts, fruit counts. So there's a lot of fluid in your daily um, intake. So. As long as your thirst is working well, thirst is a pretty good guide. Okay, if you're thirsty, your body telling you that you need to drink. Okay, so listen to your body. And again, I'm going to reiterate what Dr. Glass said, you know, the three hours before bedtime. If you have a lot of trouble with peeing at night and it's your bladder that actually wakes you up, you do want to cut that. You know, you really try not to drink anything two or three hours before bed to give it a chance to kind of get through your system, okay? And that means when you wake up at night to pee, you can't take a sip of water, okay? I have patients who do that too, so. Um, weight loss. Um, we find that obesity promotes urinary incontinence. And you don't need to lose 50 pounds or anything that dramatic. Um, sometimes five or 10 pounds seems to, you know, do the trick uh, for some. We don't, I don't think we know exactly the mechanism. You know, some people think, well, is it all the fat, the weight? It's not that, you know, five or 10 pounds is not so dramatic, but does seem to help. Um, and for some people, sometimes the bladder doesn't sense very well anymore. So what you need to get them on is actually a schedule. You have to pee by the clock, not by what you feel anymore, okay? So every three hours or so, if you can hold it that long, um, to go through that way. And sometimes you can try this bladder retraining drill, and that is, trying to teach your bladder to hold more and more over time again. So I, I, I don't want you to try to hold it for an hour, you know, each, but this is literally tiny increments. Can you hold it for an extra minute? Great, just keep holding for extra minute each time you get that urge, or five minutes. To try to force that bladder, all the sensory nerves, to kind of get used to holding a little bit more, okay? And finally, Kegel exercises, the pelvic floor muscle exercises that most of you just think of, you know, for women after they've had kids. You know, that's what your obstetrician tells you to go squeeze those muscles and make it tighter. 
It's not just to strengthen your sphincter muscle to hold it um, so that you don't leak for men or women. What it also can do, actually, there's a reflex arc. When you squeeze on this muscle, it can actually give a signal kick to the bladder and, try and calm the bladder down. Okay, and I can see this when I do studies, these urodynamic studies where I've got a little catheter in here, I can actually see your bladder, see at the con contractions. I can tell you actually when you're about to have a, have a urge because I can see these crazy spasms some, some Parkinson's patients' bladders have. But then if I tell them, do a Kegel right now, squeeze, you can see that contraction dampen, okay, so that it gives you enough time to get to the bathroom, okay, so um, huge difference what thir extra 30 seconds or a minute can make, you know, between actually wetting yourself and making it to the bathroom. So, good, exercise. Everybody should be doing them right now as you're listening to me, okay? Squeeze, hold for three seconds, and then relax, okay? 100 times a day. I'm a little bit Nazi about that, but, but the problem with it is actually most people don't do them. They work. But, you know, we all get busy and, you know, who's going to put aside 30 minutes at the end of the day to try to do these, you know, exercises? You shouldn't be doing them all at once. You should pepper them throughout the day, okay? You're waiting in line at the grocery store, you should do three, right? You should get three and you're washing dishes, you can at least do 10 or 20, right? <laughs> watching TV, 50. If you pepper throughout the day, that's what you need to train yourself to do. Then by the end of the day, you're, do you're all done, okay? So if you can really give it a good... Give it a good push for three, four months. Then you can really see whether or not it makes a difference. Okay? If it really doesn't help, then, you know, fine. Um, I'm fine with that. But I always tell patients, try it. Whatever you can do yourself, it's just less for me to do with anything invasive. Okay? And, and t it definitely shows, you know, you can decrease it by up to 80% of the incontinence uh, rates um, in, in some studies. But this is different. They get such great results because these patients are dragged in every week to do like a set of 30 minutes and, and or an hour with a therapist, right? It's, it's once you kind of leave, um, that's when it's hard to keep up. But we know it can work if you really stick with it. And then if you then add on top of it medication, then you may not need as much medication for to have an added benefit, okay? Or the medication actually works better, right? It's pretty logical. You don't need me to tell you, right? Two added together works better. 